We're beginning an exciting journey in 2021. From now until December, we are going to take a journey through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. For the entire year, we're going to focus our heart and our mind on Scripture, and we're going to chronologically and beautifully work our way through the Bible all the way through the year. It's going to be a great journey. I'm excited about it with you and me. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the gospel story, God's story, woven all the way through Scripture um, from beginning to end. Now, we will not be able to hit every single great story that's in Scripture. We will not be able to hit every character that we find in the pages. We won't be able to even hit every single book that's found in the Bible if we try to do that within this year. But what we will do is we will pull out truths about who God is in that story. We will pull the truths about what God desires for his people within that story as we work chronologically through the Bible in this time. So my hope is by the end of this year that we have a, a, a better understanding of God's story through Scripture this year. That's my hope. And so journey with me as we look at what does God have for us? Because every story tells us something about God. In fact, the Old Testament story, every story in there, whatever it is, we have to remember this one thing. God is the hero of that story. You look at like David and Goliath, you know, the little guy, big guy, and he's got slings that rock and bing, and big guy falls, right? Okay, that story, God is the hero. And I want us to have the right perspective that Jesus is at the center of it all the whole time. That he is the story of the gospel and his redemption for his people is found throughout the Old Testament stories and it launches us into the gospels and then through the letters of Paul, through to the revelation. I want us to know that it's God's story and to get a better, be better equipped on what God wants for us as his people. Because if you look at the Old Testament... You see a God who cares, who provides, who wants the best for his people, but then you see a people that God calls to himself, and they turn their back on God and do their own thing. And God allows it to happen, and then they want rescued, and then God rescues them and has great plans for them, but they continually walk away from everything that God has planned for them. You know what? That's still our story today. And by understanding how God responds to his people and what he wants to do in their lives and through their lives, we can get a better understanding of how we can live our lives and perspective of God's story through Scripture. So that's what we're going to be doing for the next add up the weeks until we get to our Advent season. We're going to be going through the gospel story through Scripture. Now, where we are starting today, next week we're going to be in Genesis. But where we're going today is a really interesting story. The story is really interesting because you have followers of Jesus who talk with Jesus but have no clue that it's Jesus. It's really interesting. You'd think that people that follow Jesus and said yes to him and, and want, the, want what he's saying in their lives, that they would recognize when he's there. But the problem is that these guys don't even understand that they're talking to Jesus. Now, this story is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. We're going to be reading from the NLT, New Living Translation. And before we read to that, I want to give us a little backstory to understand what's happening before we start talking about these guys who are talking to Jesus and they don't know Jesus is the one that they're talking to. So let me give you an idea. Now, how many of you are back in the Sunday school days of flannel graph? Do you remember flannel graphs? Does anybody remember that? Okay, flannel graph was basically the way that, that uh, Sunday school teachers would teach children and youth the stories in Scripture. And so they'd have this, like, this, uh, I don't know, felt kind of material. It was a board, like a chalkboard, and they had little characters that were already cut out all full color, and they'd put it on there, and it would stay up on the board, and then they'd introduce the little sheep and the little thing and then that, and then they'd tell the story by... by taking chronologically these little things and they tell the story, okay? So it's kind of like a cartoon on a board. So I'm going to give you a couple cartoon. I, don't, I wish I had a flannel graph with me. That'd be cool, kind of cool. Um, and, and some Vanna White to help me with that. But what we're going to do is I'm just going to show you a couple pictures to go along with our background story to the Gospel of Luke so we kind of have a good understanding of the context of where we are. The first thing is this. The several hundred years before Jesus comes on the scene, the Israelite nation, God's people, the Jewish people, they had been oppressed under the rule and reign of local government. If they had been persecuted and even under attack by the governments around them, by the nations around them, they had been suppressed as a people time and time again. Now, this oppression 
built up to the point where they, didn't, they were done. Like we, were, we want out of this and their need to be independent was crying out, was just seeping out of who they were as a Jewish nation. They wanted to come back to who they were as a sovereign nation, that they had their own place and their own um, you know, design of God's people and operate that way without other nations under them. Now we come to the, the place of where Jesus is and now the Israelites, the Jewish nation is under the, the rule of the Roman government. See, what they had done is they had studied Scripture and they had reminded themselves that the prophets talked about a Messiah, a Savior, who was going to do just that. He was going to redeem God's people and call them a nation among themselves, and they were going to rule and they were going to reign, and God had a plan for them, and He's going to use an anointed one, a Messiah, a Savior. And He was going to bring them to go from oppression to being a free people. They had reminded themselves, and, that, and their hope began to grow. They got excited about this. And along with their hope growing, so did their expectations of what this Messiah would actually do. Now, their expectations of this Messiah was a little different than what actually occurred in the Gospels. You see, many Jews believed that God was going to send this Messiah to actually take them out from Roman oppression and and they're going to be a nation of their own and they were going to squash the the Roman government and they were going to... They were going to be top dog nation. That's what they were hoping for. So along comes Jesus. Jesus comes, and many believed that this was the one. This was the Messiah, the Savior, the anointed one that was going to redeem and save God's people. And they were right. However, many people expected that God would use Jesus to allow these Jewish people to be freed from the Romans and to actually rise in power and be that top dog nation, even some of the disciples of Jesus were recorded saying, hey, Jesus, you know, when you get to be like the president of this place, you know what I mean? Uh, Can I get down the right side or the left? I mean, which one of us are going to, because we want some power. We want some position. I mean, this is going to be cool. And we're like, we're in it to win it, right? So we're in it right now for these time and we're going to be your disciples. But when it's time to shine, can we shine on your right and left? And they just, they missed it. They didn't realize that this coming Messiah, the Savior, that his redemption for his people didn't look like overthrowing the Roman government. But see, here's what they didn't realize, but we now know, is that Jesus used the cross to bring freedom for his people. We know that Jesus came, he died on the cross for our sins to bring us freedom, to bring us from oppression as a sinful people to liberation as a saved people. But see, we know that because of the cross, but they didn't know that yet, okay? So before we get ahead of ourselves too much, let's go back to where we were. The followers of Jesus are anticipating Jesus to overthrow overthrow the Roman government. That's where they are in this. So they're getting ready for that, and they're seeing Jesus do all kinds of things. They're following him. And then an interesting thing happens on a Thursday night. They get together as they normally do, the disciples and Jesus, and they have dinner together. And during this dinner, Jesus does something a little odd with something he always does. He, they normally share in the meal together, right? Hey, pass me the bread, pass me the salt, pass me the whatever. And Jesus takes some bread and he breaks it. And he thanks God for it, and he gives it to them and says, this is my body. And they're like, what? No, 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 no. This is unleavened bread with a hint of basil. What do you mean this is your body? And then he takes the cup, and he says, this cup represents the new covenant. Take and drink, and when you guys get together, remember me. They're like, remember you were together. What's going on? I don't, and they're, they're just like, whoa, hold on. I'm not catching this, so what's happening now? And then shortly afterwards, What happens? Jesus is arrested. The next day, he's tried for blasphemy. And the disciples are going, okay, Jesus has been in trouble before. He's probably going to get out of this. We're going to be cool. It's going to be good. And before they know it, you know what happens? They see their Messiah, the Savior, hanging on a criminal's cross and executed and die in front of them. Now they're going, whoa, hold on a second. We were supposed to overtake the Roman government, but now it looks like the Roman government's taken over what we thought we were going to be taking over. Like, they're, they get confused now. I mean, this freaked these guys out. And so now, what happens? He's executed. They remove his body from the cross, and they place his body in a tomb. Sabbath comes around. 
followers confused, frustrated, angry, sad, completely devastated that their rabbi, the one they've been following, their master is now dead. Where do they go from here? So the Sabbath comes, which is on Saturday. And these being good practicing Jews didn't do anything because that's what you do on the Sabbath is nothing. And then comes Sunday. Well, they get together for breakfast on Sunday, and guess who breaks in but Mary and Martha? Well, they probably break in. The door may have been open. I'm not sure. And they have some news. Guys, we were just at the tomb, and Jesus' body is gone. It's gone. In fact, an angel told us that he is risen. They're like, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, what? Like, no, this can't. his body is gone? Hold on a second. Now, there, can you imagine the confusion that's now even going, I don't get it. So Peter takes off just in his manner. He just goes for it, and along with others, and they look, and sure enough, just as the woman said, his body was gone. Well, now they're still sad. They're confused. They're, what's going to happen? I don't know. And this is where Luke picks up the story in chapter 24. And we're going to be reading, starting with verse 13 through 35. Let's follow along. It says this. The same day... Two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened, which we can imagine was a whole lot, right? As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him, Jesus. And Jesus asked them, hey, what are you guys discussing so intently as you walk along? So already we're getting a little bit of the, of the vibe here, right? They are in this discussion. They are just all over it. Like, well, what happened? I mean, could you, what, what if you, could you, I mean, they're all over the page with what's going on today. And they stopped short with sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened in the last few days. And Jesus responds, well, what things? <laughs> what things? The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. They said that he was a prophet who did powerful miracles. He was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people, but our leading priest <laughs> and the other religious leaders, they handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. And then we, see, we had hoped that he was the Messiah who was going to come to rescue Israel. And this all happened three days ago. What do you mean you don't know what's going on? I mean, notice what they said. We had hoped that he was the Messiah. There's an element that tells me that they had lost hope in that Jesus was their Messiah because he had died. Why, you see, they had hoped in something a little more selfish than what God had intended. They had hoped to rise up in leadership and in position and in authority. They were looking at it, what was in it for me? And so it says that we had hoped, which means that we didn't expect our Messiah to die, or at least not until we overthrew the Roman government. Like there was some things that were going to happen here, but that didn't happen, and now we've lost hope. Verse 22 says, they kept telling Jesus a story, which by the way, they didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus. They said, well, then some women from our group of followers, they were at the tomb early this morning and they came back with amazing report. They said that his body was missing. And they saw angels who told them that Jesus is alive. Oh, of course, some of our men, they ran out to see, you know, Peter. And sure enough, his body was gone. Just as the woman had told us. Verse 25, then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in Scripture. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Question mark? In other words, hey guys, don't you remember all the things you've been told as you were a kid? All the things that the prophets, the the, the laws of God and all these things from from what was for them, their Bible, the Old Testament for us. Don't you recall all this? And by the way, Jesus himself, me, but he didn't tell them that yet. I told you that. Like, don't you remember what the Messiah himself even told you before he was going to enter his glory, that he had to suffer, he had to die, and three days he would raise again. Aren't you remembering it was already given to you? See, these guys were so 
me focused, that they had forgotten that this is really supposed to be a Jesus focused time. They, their eyes were off of everything happening and onto, well, what about me? Well, what about? And they had just been consumed with that. And that happens though, and that's okay. It's okay. Our worlds get consumed about us because of the problems and things, things we're going in. But Jesus is trying to bring it back around that, you know what? Jesus is at the center of it all. Because what does he do? He says this in verse 27. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all Scripture the things concerning himself. I love this. Because I think about all the pastors that I've ever heard preach, all the biblical scholars that I've ever read or listened to and and been under the instruction of, and by far, none of them would pale in comparison to the teaching that, that Jesus gave of the Old Testament to those two guys right there. I wish I would have been there. I mean, Jesus himself is giving an Old Testament sermon about all things from Moses to the prophet, explaining everything that comes right back to Jesus. That would have been powerful. Man, I wish they would have written it down. I wish I I would have preached that every year. I would have just read it for you. I mean, it would have been awesome. Can you imagine being there? Jesus himself, given this, this would have been just beautiful and awesome. But what he did do is he guided all of them, those two guys, reminding them that Jesus is at the center of it all. Jesus is at the center of it all. This journey this year, we're going to take, we're going to take a Christocentric journey through the Old Testament and through the Bible. What does that mean? It's a Christocentric. Can you say that word with me? Christocentric. Christocentric means we're looking at Jesus as the theme of whatever story we're looking at. It's the gospel story. It's his story. What is his story? Of redemption of people that are lost. And bringing new life to them. That's what God's design. And so as we journey through scripture, and even on your own reading, look at the Old Testament and find where is Jesus? Where's the theme of Jesus or the theme of redemption or who Jesus is? Look for that. It's called Christocentric. It's a, it's a theological term of, of understanding and looking at scripture that way. One of my favorite, by the way, stories to look at with Christocentric eyes, to look at it through the lens of Jesus is at the middle, at the center of it all is the beautiful story of Abraham and his son Isaac. Abraham says, we're going to go and sacrifice on this mountain that God tells us about. And so they get to the place and he says, okay, now we're going to take the wood ourselves up to the hill. We're going to leave the donkeys and the camels here and the servants here, and we're going to go up the hill. So the dad carries the knife and the fire and he gives his son the wood. And so he puts the wood on his son's shoulders and they go up the hill. Christocentric means we look at that and we realize that Jesus himself took the cross and he walked it up the hill where he was going to be sacrificed. You see, the son didn't know this yet, but he was the sacrifice. God had called Abraham to sacrifice his son. And by the way, Isaac was his only son. And this act of obedience was going to show the faithfulness of Abraham to God. So they get to the top of the hill. God takes his son Isaac, and binds him up and lays him on the altar, takes his knife out, and before he sacrifices his son, obeying God's word, God stops him in the middle of that and says, stop. I know that you you love me and are faithful to me because you've obeyed what I've asked you to do, and instead of sacrificing your son, I'm going to provide a replacement. And he looks over in the thicket, and you know what he finds is a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. And he takes that ram, replaces his son on the altar, sacrifices the lamb in place of his son, and then we're reminded, Jesus sacrificed himself in place of me on that cross. He took on the sins of my and the world and he died the, the, on the cross that I should have died because I'm the one that sinned, not him. But Jesus chose to put on all the sin of the world onto Jesus and he's sacrificed on the cross for you and I. One of my favorite stories where we see the parallel of Jesus along with the Old Testament story. It's the story of Abraham and Isaac. It's a beautiful, beautiful example. Oh, let's get back to Luke's story here where Jesus is with his followers and the followers don't know it's Jesus and Jesus is given this, this amazing um, teaching on the Old Testament, the fact that, hey, it's Christocentric. Like, look at all these things that pointed towards me, but they didn't know it was him. 
So what happens? Let me remind you of verse 27 again. Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all Scripture the things concerning himself. Verse 28, by the time they were nearing Emmaus, at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going to go on, but they begged him, no, 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 stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. This is where it gets really cool. You ready? Verse 30, as they sat down to eat, what did Jesus do? He took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Light bulb, right? What does that remind you of? And it says, suddenly their eyes were opened and they what? Recognized him. And then at that moment, he disappeared. <laughs> I know. Talk about a big letdown for those guys. Like, oh, wait, 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 where were you going? Like, it was, did you guys, what you, uh, right? Amazing. In fact, then they said to each other, they said this, didn't our hearts like burn within us as, we talked, as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? I mean, they're thinking back to when Jesus was sharing the word of God with them. And they were like, don't you, you know that, that, it was just like we were on fire inside. I mean, there was something calming and soothing and challenging and motivating and, and it just ignited us, a fire within us. And there was something happened when he was talking to us. No wonder it was Jesus. He was with us, but we didn't see it. We didn't see that Jesus was with us, but that's why we felt that way. And they're just going on and on about this super cool moment that they had, that God had a word for them, that guys, even though you don't see me, I'm with you. Because Jesus is at the center of it all. And sometimes we can forget that. Sometimes we just get in our own little me world, right? Well, we think, well, the world's all about me. Sometimes we can get a little bit prideful and think, well, me, 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 me. And we forget that Jesus is at the center of it all. And we try to replace him with us and, and what we have going on. But also sometimes what happens is we come across a problem or a difficulty, a hurt, a disappointment, a crisis. And naturally, and this is okay, we become a little bit more me-focused. Well, I'm going through this and I'm having a hard time. And that's okay. That's human nature. Every one of us does that. And that's, that's all right. But what happens is, is we get focused just like these guys walking down the road and they're just, oh man, sadness written across their face. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, me, da, da, da. and Jesus is right there the whole time. What this communicates to me is that even though I may find myself drifting away and getting in my own little world, that there will be opportunities where God puts his arm around me and says, <clears throat> hey Rex, I'm still here. I am with you. I am the one who came to bring you comfort and freedom and encouragement. I want to show you my bigger purposes. And so I need you to lift up your chin a little bit. Look outside of your universe that's way smaller than what God has planned and what God wants us to see. It reminds us that God is with us. And I, I want Jesus to be the center of my life. I know you do too. I, want, I know you want Jesus to be the focal point of your life. And this life has issues. It has troubles. It has stuff that happens that do distract us from that. And my prayer is that we can remind ourselves simply of God's word. Just like Jesus did. He reminded them of all these things. And God was working on their hearts to the point where he was with them in such an intimate moment that they remembered who he was. And we need to have time with Jesus so that when we go to difficult moments, that we can remember again who he is. So I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you to know God more and more. To know who he is and what he's doing. And to not forget the power of the truth that Jesus is at the center of it all, all the time, no matter what's going on in my universe. If I think it's just about me, it's not. We need to look up and put Jesus at the center of everything and trust him with our story. That Jesus, if you're at the center of it, then I'm going to trust you with my story that I feel like is the center right now, but it's actually you. And so Lord, help me to turn my mind towards you. Interesting how the story ends in verse 33 and what happens right after Jesus disappeared. It says this, Luke reminds us of this, and within the hour, so like pretty much immediately, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. 
right? They didn't finish their breakfast. They didn't say, I'll get a refill. They were just like, we're gone. Why? Because they found the 11 disciples, the other ones, and all who had gathered with them to say, the Lord has really risen. He appeared. He appeared to Peter and then the two from Emmaus. Those guys, well, they told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along. And then they had this like warm heart thing. And then he broke the bread and how they recognized him right there. It was just amazing. And they went on and on about this. Why? They couldn't wait to share the fact that Jesus was with them when they didn't realize he was with them because Jesus is at the center of it all. And that's a story worth telling. Honestly, when, people, when you go on and on and on and on about you, people just kind of start thinking about what's next, right? <laughs> I mean, your story has good stuff, but Jesus' story is really the story we need to be focused on. Lord, help us it, to weave our stories together. Lord, help me to realize that in my story that you have a bigger story that you're, that you're accomplishing. Because the story of Jesus is a way bigger story and a better story to keep to ourselves. And these guys, I mean, they were like, we got to tell somebody. Let's go find them and let's share about this. This is really cool. This is awesome. And, and so the gospel spread. And Jesus, of course, gives them that last commission, go and make disciples. It's too good to keep for ourselves. Here's a takeaway for me. The takeaway for me on this is that it's okay to be hurt, to be disappointed, to be distracted, to be overwhelmed with me. It, that's okay. That happens. That's human tendency. But we can't forget that Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. We can't forget that He is our Savior. We can't forget that He is with us through it. And the only way for me to, to help myself, remember, is to know Jesus more. And I, want, I desire for Jesus to be the center of my life, of my family, of our church. I know that you desire the same thing, for Jesus to be the center of everything. And so to know him should be our highest calling. To know him now so that when it gets difficult, we can be reminded then. There's this wonderful song that I learned years ago called Knowing You. It says, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you. There is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. Knowing you should be our greatest desire and purpose so that we can keep our hearts and our minds centered on the fact that Jesus is at the center. So my challenge to you today, know him. Know him more and more. Know the desire, the plan, the love, the grace, the mercy that he has for you. Uncover the word. As we go through this journey this year, make it personal. Yeah, that story might be about somebody else, but you can find yourself in that story. And more importantly, what is God doing in your life through that story? And the other challenge is when you find yourself at the center of it all, can you ask God to show you that Jesus is? Can you ask him to change your focus so that you can receive encouragement when you're discouraged through Jesus? So that you can receive hope when you feel like all is lost because of Jesus? So that you can recognize that when Satan tells you, reminds you of your past, you can remember, I'm forgiven because of Jesus. I am a child of God, Satan, so shut up. Because Jesus is at the center of my life, and that's the direction that I'm going. And we can make a difference in our world when we're Jesus-focused. Because he empowers us with his spirit to tell the same story to other people, and they need to hear it. And we can make a difference when we become Christocentric with Jesus at the center. Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we finish this morning? Some of us have re recognized that, man, we have become way more me-focused than we should. And Jesus this morning is reminding us, I have something for you, and I just want to show you my love, my care. I'm going to provide. I'm going to forgive. And we needed this morning to just realign our minds on Jesus. And it reminds us to know him more and more. Maybe this morning your, your challenge is, I just, God, help me to know you. Maybe the challenge is, Lord, help me to help, help other people know you. And Lord, when I become too me-focused, 
God, would you reorient my life? I give you permission to do whatever you need to do to get my attention. Father, will you be with us? We're in many categories this morning, but we are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And I thank you that you call us by name to be your children and that you forgive us every sin and you renew us, you restore us to be used for you. Father, my prayer is that, Jesus, you will be the center of this church. You'll be the center of every one of our lives so that we can point other people to you as well. Thank you, Lord, for the work you're doing today. We know that you're still at work in us even tomorrow. We love you, and we follow after you. In your name we pray, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace today. Amen. Amen. You are sent. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching at Pursuit Church. We pray that the teaching today will encourage your faith in Jesus Christ to draw you closer to him and give you a better understanding of his word. If there's a way that we can minister to you, pray for you, or encourage you in your faith, please reach out to us on our website, PursuitNazarene.org, and click on Connection Card. Also, you can share this video with others and encourage them. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.